Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to the coast of Flanders in October 1914 and to the story of a man chosen by a strange destiny to win the First World War. As Robert Buckner tells it in his classic tale... The man who won the war. Gentlemen, I have asked this board to meet by the authority vested in me as chairman of the Naval Committee of the House of Commons. A great wrong has been done, gentlemen, and I have been asked by my colleagues of the House to see if it cannot be righted. An English naval officer was found guilty of treason by this board ten years ago. I have asked you gentlemen to meet and reconsider his case. I ask you to remove the stigma from the name of a man whom I consider to be one of England's greatest heroes. I refer to Commander Edward Bradman. (coughs) Now see here, Mr. Ordway. Yes, Admiral. I am compelled to say, Mr. Ordway, that it is a waste of the Admiralty's time and a sorry commentary upon the times in which we live. When the Royal Navy is brought to heel by a parliamentary committee. Yeah, yeah. Bradman had a thoroughly fair court martial. No single piece of evidence came to light to substantiate his fantastic story. There is no record of his action in the Belgian War Office. There is not a single witness to his weird adventure upon the Flanders beach that night in October 1914. Why, damn it, man! The Royal Navy itself tried to find the evidence, but we couldn't. And why couldn't we? Because it does not exist. I have evidence, gentlemen. New evidence. That is why you have been asked to meet. And um, as for the Navy's attempts to clear Bradman's name, I would like you to meet a young man and listen a moment to him. Edward. Edward, would you kindly tell the gentleman your name? Uh, I'm Edward Bradman III. How old are you, Edward? Thirteen years and six months. Who is your father, Edward? Commander Edward Bradman, sir. And your grandfather? Who was he? Admiral Edward Bradman. And your great-grandfather? Lieutenant Edward Bradman, sir. Uh, He was killed in action aboard the Victory at Trafalgar. And you, Edward? What do you wish to become? A midshipman, sir. I shouldn't be surprised. And have you made application? Yes, sir. At the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth. And where you accepted? No, sir. Why not? Well, they... They said there was no place in... In the Royal Navy for... For traitors. Or their sons. Well, gentlemen... This is scarcely added proof. And I must censor you, Mr. Ordway... For bringing this lad in here... Wrapped in the Union Jack, so to speak. Subjecting him to such an ordeal. A disgraceful cheap show. Admiral, I am not on trial here. The Royal Navy is. You want added proof of Commander Bradman's innocence? You shall have it. Here. Here is a letter from the Commander... Brought to me three days ago by the gentleman sitting here beside me. Commander Bradman is lying ill at Newport across the channel in Belgium. Seriously ill of a tropical fever he contracted during those years when he fled the disapproval of Navy men throughout the Empire. This may be the last word you will ever hear from Commander Bradman, gentlemen. I charge you, listen carefully. It is dated October 24th, Auberge des Deux Matelots, Newport, Belgium, gentlemen. It is ten years ago tonight that I first set foot upon this Flemish beach. I have returned here tonight under a sort of compulsion, like Like a criminal criminal returning to the scene of his crime. But I am no criminal, and what I did here ten years ago was no crime. I am tired of saying it and of being disbelieved. I am tired, and I am ill. I shall not make this statement again... I make it this last time at the encouragement of the man who brings it to you, the proprietor of this little inn, and the one man in the world who has ever believed my story. (laughs) 
When the war began, I was placed in command of the destroyer Firedrake attached to Admiral Hood's battle force on North Sea Patrol. On the night of October the 28th, 1914, the Firedrake was cruising up the Belgian coast to join the main fleet. We'd taken aboard some extra shells and ammunition at Plymouth, along with several cases of Scotch whiskey, since the fleet was looking forward to extended action. And I'm afraid those cases were uppermost in our mind that night as we sat around the wardroom after dinner. I say, Commander, what brand of whiskey did ship supplies put aboard? Oh, I don't know. Johnny Walker, I don't see. I don't believe so, sir. Cameron Highlander, I think it said on the boxes. Oh, come now, Mr. Ainsley. They always supply us with Johnny Walker Black Label. Johnny Walker, Cameron Highlander, or essence of the Loch Ness Sea Serpent, so long as there's whiskey aboard. Now, that um, wouldn't be a hint, would it? Oh, no, no, oh, no, sir. Uh, but it is nippy on deck tonight. Do you concur, Mr. Ainsley? Oh, yes, indeed, sir. The wind's got a bite to it. Man could catch himself a nasty cold out there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, you scoundrels. Hopper. Aye, sir. Go down to the storeroom and uh, break out a bottle of that whiskey we took aboard this afternoon. Aye, sir. Anything new on the fighting in Flanders, Commander? Well, what there is, is all bad. General Haig has his hands full in the center. On the right, the French are just barely holding. But the real danger is right up there to our stubborn. How's that, sir? The left flank. The Belgian sector. Von Kluck's third army is pressing hard. If he breaks through the Belgian line, you can ride off France. I don't understand, sir. Well, if the Belgians don't hold, Von Kluck will cut off the channel ports, Calais, Boulogne, and Le Havre. There's nothing to stop him until he reaches the Atlantic. And that will also cut off our supply line to our troops. Precisely. It's the Clausewitz strategy for the conquest of Western Europe. Paris would be bypassed and caught between giant pincers to be taken later at the Kaiser's leisure. Beg your pardon, sir. Ah, uh, here's Hopper with our wee drop. Yes, well, you needn't have brought the whole case, Hopper. I wanted you to see it, sir. I've opened four of them, and the contents are all the same. You see, I was right. It says Cameron Highlander on the box. Yes, sir. But the contents are not Cameron Highlander whiskey. They're Cameron Highlander uniforms. What? Yes, sir. See here, the kilts, the Glengarry's, the sporen. But where's the whiskey? Well, near as I can make out, there ain't any, sir. What's that? But I'd say them box contain nearly 200 Scotch Islander uniforms. Oh, oh, oh. well, I'm afraid that this will be a dry voyage, gentlemen. How could <laughs> they have made such a stupid mistake? Oh, blame it on the wall. Well, I just hope that our shells don't turn out to be coffee canisters. What should I do with these boxes? Oh, stow them out of the way until we make port again, Harper. Meantime, I dare say there are some poor Scotch beggars somewhere in France who'll have to do with their old clothes a little while longer. Speaking to you, sir. Bridge here. Bridge here. Mr. Twiddle requests the captain to come to the bridge. Oh, acknowledge. Mr. Will you please, Mr. Gilliam? Yes, sir. Captain, come to the bridge. Oh, what kind of trouble do you suppose captain Twiddle's run into? Are you coming along, Ainsley? Oh, might as well. Can't drink kilts and Glengarry's. Well, freshening up a bit. Yes, you'll be on our beam ends before morning. Yes, Mr. Twiddle? I thought you ought to see this, sir. What? Look out there on our starboard quarter. A tiny light. Oh, yes. I see it. Yeah. Take a look through the night glasses. Yeah. Flashing on and yeah. off. According to my reckoning, we're off the mouth of the Isa River. Now, if you look at this chart, you'll see that there are no lighthouses along this stretch of coast. Yet there's a flashing light where no light ought to be. Perhaps it's a signal of some sort, sir. Yes, undoubtedly. But who's? The Germans can't have gotten this far. How can you be sure, Mr. Ainsley? Now, wait a minute. That light's flashing a message in Morse code. G R O G. G R O G. The quartermaster. Aye, sir. Change course to 110. Change course to 110. Aye, sir. What you got to do, sir? I've got to take a closer look. But, sir, this might be a trap. Yes, it might. But don't you recognize the code word grog, Mr. Twiddle? No, sir. You, um, you didn't serve in the Royal Navy as a midshipman, did you, Mr. Twiddle? No, sir. My apprenticeship was in the merchant service. Well, then, of course, grog wouldn't mean anything to you. I don't understand, sir. Well, Mr. Tweddle, G-R-O-G is a midshipman's joke. It means good rum on goose days. I still don't understand, sir. When is goose day? That's the joke, Mr. Tweddle. Goose day never comes. Oh. Yeah, they're juvenile, I admit, but fascinatingly esoteric when you're 14 years old. But why would anybody be sending a midshipman's code word from the coast of Belgium in the middle of a war? Now, that, Mr. Ainsley, is what we're going in to find out. Be good enough to tick off a landing party, will you? Number two power launch. We'll go ashore in ten minutes. Oh, what? But, Captain. You have your orders, Mr. Ainsley. Yes, sir. You can't be serious, Captain. I am, Mr. Twiddle. Oh, this might be a trap. We have no way of knowing whether the Germans have advanced beyond this point or not. Yes. 
It might be a trap. Or it might be some poor beggar trying to escape the advance. Well, it's well worth looking into. If they were sending a plain SOS, I might be suspicious, but the choice of that half-secret smarty's code word makes me think it's worth looking into. But suppose it is a trap. Uh, Mr. Tweddle, it would be somewhat the reverse of the classic rules of warfare for a land force, no matter how large, to attempt the capture of a naval vessel on the high seas. Nevertheless, the enemy's devilishly clever. Oh, don't you worry, Mr. Tweddle. I'm not asking you to go ashore. I'm leading the landing party myself. Well, it's not a matter of fear, sir. Naturally. But one of caution. Yes, of course. I'll speed ahead. Uh, half speed the ahead. fleet Stop. orders clearly state... I am quite aware of the contents of the fleet orders, Mr. Tweddle. And they state that elements of the Royal Navy are to give all possible aid and assistance to shore positions. They also limit such aid to ship to the class of the Mercy in seven. That is very true, Mr. Tweddle. Then we'll stretch the limits of that portion of the order a little, shall we? Furthermore, we're under specific orders to rendezvous with the flagship at dawn. Then we may be a little late. Sir, I protest that Mr. this Tweddle. is not... Apparently things are different in the merchant service. But in His Majesty's fighting ships, an executive officer does not protest to his commander. You will heave to and drop anchor. Now, if I've not returned within an hour, you will proceed to the fleet rendezvous. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Carry on. I'd say we're about a half mile down the beach from the light now, sir. Good. Swing her in shore. Aye, sir. That light is getting dimmer and dimmer. Yes, it's probably only a pocket torch. Battery is burning out. All right, men. Now then, listen to me. Yes, sir. When we get to the beach, we'll spread out ten feet apart and proceed toward that light. Now you'll keep well down, walk with the utmost quiet. If you encounter a sentry, you try to knock him out before he challenges you. Use your firearms only as a last resort. We are not here to get into a battle, only to investigate that light. Now, if we should be engaged by the enemy, I will fire three rapid shots as a signal to return to the boat. Hopper and Spurgeon will remain with the boat. Head lower, Hopper. Gotcha. If we have to retreat in a hurry, you wait until the last possible moment before you shove off. Yes, sir. Uh, any questions? It's all clear, sir. All right. Brace yourself, lads. We're coming into the surf. Come in. Move. Over the side and hold your rifles high. Imagine the fearful anxiety with which our little landing party hit the beach that October midnight in 1914. We had no way of knowing whether the coast was in Belgian or German hands. We did not know indeed whether we were being drawn into a German trap by the tiny light we had seen flashing out to sea. That tiny, weakening light toward which we were now slowly advancing, spread out across the beach, alert for any danger, watchful for enemy sentries or patrols. And then, not a hundred yards from where we landed, we encountered a German sentry. He was asleep. The poor beggar, I, I suppose he imagined no one would be around the sand dunes in the middle of the night. And he was undoubtedly done in. He was sitting on a log. He'd taken off his boots to bury his aching feet in the cool sand. I'm afraid he wasn't a very fearful example of the German military machine that night. But with no trouble at all, Mr. Ainsley and I crept up on him. I had him bound and gagged before he was quite awake. There we are. I don't think he'll raise too much of a hue and cry now, sir. No, I should think not. Now, my friends, light and see, Ulrich. Und ihnen wird nichts passieren. Take him along, Mr. Ainsley. Mark it, sir. You put on this fellow's spiked helmet. And remain at his post. If a relief sentry appears, you take care of him. But no shooting unless absolutely necessary. Yes, sir. Now, let's get cracking, men. Hold up, sir. What's that? I thought I heard voices. All right, men. Halt. Ah, they're speaking French. Then they're allies. Well, still, we must make certain. You take two of them, then, and come up on them from the rear. Yes, sir. I'll approach from the side. Now, I'll do the talking. If it's a trap, I'll give the signal to fire. After one volley, you break for it and rendezvous with the launch. Yes, sir. Evan, Stanley, come with me. Aye, sir. Wilkins, Rodman, No. Aye, sir. Follow me quietly. Keep your heads down. Aye. 
Merci. Pas longtemps, mon vieux, pas encore. Allô Qu'est-ce qu'on fait là Qu'est-ce qu'on désire Attention, c'est là cette voie. À gauche. Les Allemands. Ah, silence. Qui est là Vos amis. Anglais. Grâce à Dieu. Approchez, s'il vous plaît. What do you say, sir It's said to approach. I, the Belgian, the French. Come on, men. Bonsoir, messieurs. Bonsoir, mon ami. Est-ce que vous parlez anglais? Uh, comment? Uh, why, yes, I speak English a little. Mm. Well, I dare say your English is better than my French. Uh, may I introduce myself? I'm Commander Bradman of His Majesty's ship Fyderick. Oh, I can't tell you how glad I am to meet you, Commander. And I am Major de Lesseps of the 3rd Belgian Dragoons. This is Lieutenant Chapotin. Je chante, je chante, Monsieur le Commandant. And uh, here's one of my company, Lieutenant Ainsley. Monsieur. And who is this bound and gagged? Oh, that's an uh, enemy sentry we picked up on the way. You can have him. Thank you. We saw your light from the ship. Whatever made you flash the word grog? Wow, I thought a Royal Navy man would respond more quickly to grog than SOS. Yes, it was an inspiration, but where did you uh, learn it? Oh, I used to sail in the regattas at Cowes when I was younger. And one of my best friends was Albert Hollister. He was a midshipman in those days. Oh, Bertie Hollister. Yes, I knew him well. Oh, he's a street striper now, gunnery officer on the repulse. Uh, yes. Uh, we can go into that another time. Um, what was the reason for your signal, Major? Simply this, Commander. We're in trouble, serious trouble. We've been pushed back day after day until our men are completely exhausted. Our orders are to make a stand here at the Easier River long enough to give the sappers time to blow the dikes. Once the dikes are broken, the river should stop the enemy. For how long will it take to blow the dikes? We must hold the line until sundown, roughly 18 hours. And you can't do that? I seriously doubt it, Commander. We've appealed to General Haig for help, but he's completely engaged on our right and can't send us any reinforcements. The French are too far south, and they have their hands full, too. It was my suggestion at tonight's staff meeting to seek help from the sea. It's our last chance. Well, what do you want us to do? Stand by us. Bring your guns to bear on the enemy's advance. But we're only a destroyer, Major. Our firepower is too low to do any good whatsoever. And we haven't the range for offshore bombardment. Alas, then we are finished. And so is the war. There is nothing between von Kluck and Paris but us. I'm sorry, Major. Uh-huh. They are starting the barrage early this morning. I suppose they know this is the last day. Yes, I suppose. Oh, wait a minute. I have an idea. Mr. Ainsley. Sir? The kilts. The kilts, sir? Yes, we can put a company of Cameron Highlanders into the Belgian lines. I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I Major, don't... Major, we can help you. It's a long, long shot, but it might work. What might work, Commander? Well, somebody made a botch back in Plymouth and loaded us with eight cases of Scotch uniforms instead of Scotch whiskey. There are nearly 200 complete uniforms of the first Cameron Highlanders aboard. Yes, but I don't understand... We'll what... give them to you, Major. You put them on a company of your men. Let them show themselves in the front line. When the attack begins this morning, perhaps... Perhaps the Germans will think the British have rushed in a crack division to reinforce you. Yes, yes, it might work. Yes. We can let you have a few Lewis guns, too. But they will not be much help unless the uniforms do the trick. It's, as you say, a long shot, but let's try it. Very well. Mr. Ainsley? Sir. You go back to the ship at once, fetch those cases of uniforms and four cases of Lewis guns with ammunition. Aye, sir. I'll remain here with the Major and help him get his men lined up. Oh, and uh, Ainsley. Uh, sir. Uh, should Mr. Tweddle inquire, uh, you might tell him I'll be uh, detained a while longer uh, winning the war. Yes, sir. <laughs> There's a sight I shall never forget. Two hundred men solemnly changing their battle dirty green uniforms for the gay kilts and tartans in the pale light of the setting moon. Everything was done with the utmost dispatch and in utter silence. And it seemed to me that the bright clad put new energy as well as hope into the battle-weary Belgians. They look like the real thing, don't they? Yes, they certainly do. You know, I believe this will work. Oh, I, I nearly forgot, sir. What, Ainsley? Mr. Tweddle asked me to tell you the flagship's been trying to reach you for wireless. Oh, what did they want? Mr. Tweddle didn't say, sir. Well, they'd have to wait until this business is finished. Mr. Tweddle said he'd replied, sir. Oh, yeah, well, very well, then. That's the last of him. A thousand thanks, sir. Oh, not at all. Scotch kilts are precious little use to a ship full of sailors. But they may do a turn for you this morning. I feel sure they will. Well, we, uh, we must be on our way. Less than an hour until daybreak. Goodbye, Major. Goodbye, Commander. Are you, uh, you must look me up after the war. You always reach me at the Navy Club in St. James's Square. Well, thank you, sir. I'll do that. Au revoir. Au revoir, Major. A uh, bon chance, and uh, that sort of thing. Huh? Well, 
Well, Mr. Pedro, I think we can get underway now. Uh, finished with your visit to shore, sir? Scarcely a social call, Mr. Tweddle. I think we may have been of some help to our allies this morning. Of course, sir. Uh, oh, Captain, the flagship's been trying to reach you. Yes, yes, Mr. Ainsley said uh, I signaled them that you'd gone ashore. Oh, you did? Well, that must have intrigued them. Well, I shouldn't say they were pleased. I just received this reply from them. Mm -hmm. As senior officer present aboard, you are ordered to take command of Fire Drake and proceed to Fleet Rendezvous immediately. Well, that's a neat double cross, Mr. Twiddle. I'm sorry, Mr. Bradman, but my responsibility is to the ship on which I serve. Yes, yes, I can see it is. However, since you're once more aboard... Oh, no, Mr. Twiddle. You have your orders from the flag. Follow them. Meddling, rulebook sailor. His captious wireless message had made an unnecessary embarrassment for me. But I had no doubts that my explanation of the night's work would fully satisfy the Admiral. So, let Mr. Tweddle have his little moment of triumphant command. I stood out on the starboard bridge wing as we pulled away from the Belgian coast. And through my binoculars, in the grey dawn, I thought I saw the flashing red and yellow of the Cameron flag as the last day of the First Battle of Flanders began. As I expected, the Admiral made a thorough investigation of the matter, and a few days later I faced him in his quarters aboard the flagship. Mr. Bradman, your little adventure of a few nights ago involved some very serious breaches of discipline. You disposed of war material without authorization. You left your ship without authorization. You deliberately violated the fleet orders regarding assistance to land forces. And I managed to stop the German advance dead in its tracks, sir. Mr. Bradman, we know that the German advance has been stopped. But it was stopped by opening the dikes of the Iso River. A plan which has been part of the Belgian and French grand strategy for years. Sir, the dikes would never have been opened if the Belgian lines hadn't held that last day of the battle. And they were held because the Germans' attack was slowed down. And it was slowed down because the Germans thought the Belgians were reinforced by the first Cameron Highlanders. Mr. Bradman, I have given your story the benefit of every doubt. I have even queried the Belgian general staff to try to substantiate it. I have their reply. They have no record of any unit being outfitted in Highlanders' uniforms. This wasn't a general staff matter, sir. It was on a regimental letter. I may say there is even some doubt on the part of the members of your crew whether or not the men who received the uniforms were Belgians. What? Yes, Mr. Tweddle says. Mr. Tweddle? That meddling fool from the cargo that ship... That is enough, Mr. Bradman. It is the decision of the Fleet Inquiry Board that you be relieved of your command, placed in irons, and be returned to Hull to face court-martial at the earliest possible moment. The court-martial at Hull sustained the Board of Inquiry's decision, and I spent the rest of the war in prison. Afterwards, naturally, I had to leave England, and wherever I went, Cape Town, Vancouver, Singapore, Melbourne, sooner or later, the story, their story followed me. Sooner or later, some ex-Navy man would turn up who recognized me, and I would have to move on. At last, I have come back to this Belgian beach where it all happened, and here I have found the one man who believes my story. He is, he is the, the proprietor, proprietor of this little, little inn where I now lie ill and too tired to fight any longer. It is too late now to worry about my reputation. But he has persuaded me to write this letter that my son may not have to bear the undeserved infamy which I have been forced to endure. And he has kindly offered to carry this message to any who may yet be interested in clearing the record of Edward Bradman, Commander, Royal Navy. Uh, that's uh, all very well, Mr. Ordway. But there is not a single statement in that letter that has not been entered as evidence in Bradman's court-martial. There's no new proof. There's nothing here... Excuse me, Admiral. I wish to present to this board the bearer of Commander Bradman's letter, Mr. Wolfgang Bechtel. Guten Tag, gentlemen. Uh, you are the proprietor of the Auberge des Deux Matelots, where Commander Bradman is now staying. Yeah, I am. Uh, but your accent, you are German, aren't you? Uh, yes. And how is it that you own an inn on the Belgian coast? Uh, after the war, I could no longer bear to live in Germany in the midst 
of the misery that I had helped to cause. So I too, like a criminal returning to the scene of his crime, went back to the beach at Neuport. I have been there ever since. Uh, this is all very interesting, but I don't see what it is. Sir, Peter, to... please. I am the proof you have been asking for. I swear that every word of Commander Bretman's statement is truth. Commander Bretman is indeed the man who won the war. I know, because I am the man who lost the war. I was the sentry who fell asleep. <laughs> Shipman Edward Bradman. Yes, sir. Advance three paces. Midshipman Bradman, as Commandant of the Royal Navy College, it is my honor, by order of His Most Gracious Majesty George V, to ask you to receive this Victoria Cross, awarded posthumously to your late father, Commander Edward Bradman, for gallantry and intrepidity beyond the line of duty. And to try to accept the humble apologies of a belatedly grateful empire. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robson. And as tonight presented, The Man Who Won the War by Robert H. Buckner, dramatized for radio by Mr. Robson. Featured in the cast was Ben Wright as Commander Bradman. Also heard were John Daner, Terry Kilburn, Joseph Kearns, Barton Yarborough, Jeff Corey, Ian Wolfe, Paul Fries, Charlie Lung, and John Hoyt. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are standing on the floor of the sea in the middle of the sunken city of Port Royal with its fabulous chests of treasure waiting to be hauled to the surface. But your life depends on the ship above you where the treachery of your partners has left you with no escape. Next week, Escape will be heard at a new time on Friday evening. Next week, we escape with the story of a diver who discovered an entire city beneath the sea, Port Royal, an exciting tale suggested by Lieutenant Harry Reisberg's book, I Dive for Treasure. Goodbye, then, until a week from Friday, when once again we offer you Escape. Now stay tuned for the adventures of Philip Marlowe, which follow immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for the adventures of Philip Marlowe. 10 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. Bulova Maxim, including band valued at $12.75. Complete, only $29.75. President Truman, General Marshall, and Henry Fonda will tell you about a gallant fight against misfortune 30 minutes from now on a special broadcast entitled Across the Street, Across the Nation. WCBS AM and FM, New York.